Good evening, students. Um, we will begin with our class now because it's already uh, four fifteen your time, and for me it's five fifteen already. So I'll just admit students for another probably five or ten minutes, and then stop doing that because um, today's lecture is going to be a little bit vast. Um, in the sense, I understand it's oxymoronic because I said a little bit, and then I said vast. Well, to be precise, it's going to take a little bit longer than usual because today I'm going to deal with two important chapters. Um, they are highly significant for your exams, that is an examination point of view, and also for your general understanding. And uh, apart from that, um, I'll be covering two chapters altogether. And uh, yeah, so that is it. So I think we'll, we will begin now. Uh, so, so far, what have you learned? So far, you have learned about general uh, you know, idea. You got a general idea about international law and how it is, you know, it's connected to diplomacy that we learned in the first class. Uh, during the first session, we learned a, a little concept, certain concepts of international law. And then we saw the nexus between international law and diplomacy. Next, in the next class, that is the next lecture, we moved on to study chapter two, that is types and forms of diplomacy. And we saw how, what are the different forms of what are the different types of diplomacy? Next, we learned about ethics, morality, culture, and their connection with diplomacy, or so to say, the nexus between ethics, morality, culture, and diplomacy. Then last class, uh, does anyone remember what we learned during the last class? You can unmute your mic. Does anyone remember what we learned during the last class? Well, if you want to gain maximum marks for the subject, you'll have to do a little bit of revision and you'll have to read up before you come to class, at least what was done during the last class and uh, you know just get prepared a little bit because you... I mean, you must expect certain questions that would be asked during the class. Okay, I'll ask again. Uh, what means bargaining power in diplomacy? Well, see, I told you class interaction also carries marks. It, it's not just uh, with respect to you asking me questions pertaining to the present lecture. It could be even questions that I would ask you with respect to earlier classes, it's just for me to, you know, just ascertain, like, what is the level of your understanding? Well, never mind. Um, before we move further, I'd like to remind you that this next class, that is next Friday, is going to be our last class because we'll be com completing the syllabus. And after that, you'll have one week of your individual revision. That is, it's for you to revise just before the exams. And of course, as usual, uh, it's the, for the university to decide the exact date, you can just get in touch with the university and ask for the tentative date of your examinations. Well, so coming back to the last class where I was, I was talking about the last class, we learned about bargaining power and diplomacy. And today we're going to learn a very important topic. And in fact, a very interesting topic that is diplomatic conferences, protocols and procedures. I remember I told you during the last class that UNGA is going on and uh, in fact, it is still going on. United Nations General Assembly meetings are still going on. And they're talking about um, various uh, topics and subjects that is concerning world security at the moment and you know, certain war, that, a particular war that is going on till now and so on. I also send certain links. I send you video links on your, uh, you know, I mean, I posted it in your Google Classroom just for you to uh, access it easily. Apart from that, you could also search YouTube and find out or any other, uh, you know, video links, Google links to find out what is the present state of international affairs. And you could even get some points on diplomatic relationship, international diplomatic relationship, and how diplomacy plays a very important role because you're, I mean, you're the student of that particular subject, international diplomacy. So you are, in fact, it's you're obligated, it is mandatory for you to know what is the present state of affairs in the world. Well, today we will deal about conferences. As I said, example, UNGA, the meeting that is going on. And there are several conferences likewise. I gave you examples of even meetings last class. Now, Today, we're going to talk about even protocols and procedures. What is, uh, let's not go into, you know, um, the difficult aspect of it, but just let's use our mind and understand what, what means a protocol or 
what do you understand by protocol? Well, protocol is nothing but something related to certain rules, just simply speaking, or just, you know, in lay terms without going into the, uh, you know, the, the details of it or, um, you know, going into the complexity of the definition. If just simply speaking, protocol is nothing but certain etiquette or certain rules of behavior or socially accepted standards of behavior or even particular standards of behavior that is widely accepted. Now, we are going to study this widely accepted behavior, so-called widely accepted behavior or certain rules of etiquette. How is it applicable to diplomatic conferences? So in diplomatic conferences, we refer to it as protocols. For diplomatic conferences, we refer to these rules of you know, functioning in an appropriate manner, in a socially acceptable manner, or as per certain rules or standard rules that are established by a particular department, or it could be even the UNO, whatever, based on a particular charter of an international organization. So they function as per the particular charter. They carry on with the meetings as per that particular charter. So they follow the rules of etiquette as per that particular you know, guidelines that are laid down, acceptable standards. So that is protocol. Just to set the perspective, I'm just trying to explain to you in, in simple terms. Now, who prepares these protocols when it comes to international diplomacy? When it comes to international diplomacy, protocols are certain rules of behavior or, you know, widely accepted standard of behavior is prepared by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of any nation. Are you understanding me? This is just a kind of a general idea that I'm trying to give you before we go into you know the real aspect of it and delve into deeper and go through our slides i'm just setting the perspective just for you to understand so protocols so what is a protocol protocol is nothing but just general rules of behavior that is acceptable or certain standards that are devised after 4 30 i'll not admit anyone in the classroom because i mean things are not changing it's happening week after week well Okay, let's get back to this. So, yeah, we were talking about protocols. So what is the purpose of these protocols? I just want you to, you know, just exercise your mind a little bit and think about it. Why do we need protocols? Or so to say, why do you think does uh, diplomatic conferences require certain rules to be followed uh, for the purpose of, uh, you know, uh, conducting a meeting or conducting a conference. Obviously, that is to show certain, uh, you know, they want to be organized. They want to show certain respect to the head of the state. Naturally, high diplomatic ranks deserve a particular honor and respect because, you know, it is a highest office in the country. For example, heads of the state. It's a highest office in the country. State in the sense in the international law perspective, it's a country. So heads of state. So it's a highest uh, head of a state, a particular state, if we're talk, talk, talking about a particular state, so a head of a state or the constitution head of a state, or even if it's a monarch, or it's an emperor, it depends what kind of, uh, uh, you know, nation it is, whether it is, um, you know, it, it, it is ruled by, uh, you know, monarchs or kings or whoever, or it is a democratic setup. So protocols, the purpose of protocols is uh, basically to see that things are, <clears throat> sorry, things function in an appropriate manner and in an organized format. So if you think about it, every, anything and everything has protocols, if you think about it, like, for example, if you think about the internet working system, I'm sure you heard about internet protocols or networking protocols, like this HTTP and all their protocols, right? So protocols are normally have become part of the corporate sector. Protocols have become part of, you know, IT sector. And I mean, it's part of mostly every professional sector. So likewise, you know, obviously even protocols are an important part of even diplomatic conferences and international meetings. 
having just set the perspective, let us move forward and go to our slides. Now, what is this diplomatic conference? Diplomatic conferences play a significant role in building international relations. If you have gone through the links that I've sent to you, you will understand what are these conferences, how do they function, how the diplomats express their opinion, how the diplomats defend their country, how the diplomats, uh, it's, you know, when you defend a country, it's just not mere words. It has to be evidenced. Some of the countries, they come up with, you know, certainly everybody has got the right of defense. If you watch these conferences or even the links that I've sent you, there are certain uh, countries or even I want you to even, um, you know, uh, Google it out for some more conferences just for you to view it online that is even through YouTube and so on. So you would see that how these diplomats, they defend their country and sometimes they are just hollow words without any evidence. However, it is a rule of international law or in the, uh, for that matter, it is a normal, widely accepted rule that whenever we talk something, it has to be on a particular, based on a particular foundation. There has to be proper evidence. Whatever we talk, it has to be backed by an evidence. If we are casting an allegation against some other country, so it has to be backed by, uh, you know, an evidence. It has, there has to be an evidence for that. Evidentiary backing is a must. So diplomatic conferences play a significant role in building international relationship. It plays a significant role in, uh, you know, sometimes defending a particular nation where the diplomats defend their country that they represent in case there is an allegation or in case there is a kind of a complaint against a particular nation. Diplomats play a, a you know, a pivotal role in defending their country. And these diplomatic conferences are obviously not like the normal business conferences or even it's other international conferences on certain other subjects like art and culture. It's not similar to that, but diplomatic conferences are conferences in which diplomats participate. They're basically plenipotentiaries or you know, they participate in a meeting, they hold a high office, uh, they represent a particular country, and they participate in a meeting to negotiate on any given subject or policy or even treaty on behalf of the government that they represent. So thereby, it's a meeting between high officials, government representatives, or even government heads of various nations. Next is summits. Summits are normally attended by political heads of state. You must have heard of various summits. So they are normally attended by the political heads of state. And summits may be followed by a diplomatic conference or a coalition diplomacy meeting to concretize the understanding between state parties or that between nations. International organizations play a pivotal role in organizing and sponsoring conferences as well that may involve multilateral negotiation. For example, you must have heard of Arabian League. Now, how are treaties actually adopted, ratified, revised, and readopted? And in fact, it is to this date with the help of diplomatic negotiation. If you have heard of several treaties that are, uh, you know, you must have heard of treaties because you're an international law student. So several treaties, they have been adopted, ratified, revised, and readopted till date by this mechanism through diplomatic negotiations. Then speaking of the United Nations Organization, the UNO holds several conferences, meetings, and annual meetings hosting all member countries to engage in an open dialogue and participate in discussion and negotiation of subjects that may be made a part of the agenda. Next is United Nations diplomatic conferences are convoked or convened that is called by a particular resolution, resolution that has to be passed. See, I'm repeating, United Nations, any diplomatic conferences that where it organizes a diplomatic conferences. So it convenes it, that is, it convenes, it validly convenes it is by giving a proper notice. It, you know, it uh, sends notices to people, notification to the member states for them to participate. So it has to be appropriately convened, appropriately convoked by Prior to notification, it has to be by a resolution that is passed by the General Assembly. 
Now, this resolution is adopted on the recommendation of one of its subsidiary bodies, which specifies the object, the terms and conditions of the member states to be complied with to participate in the conference or a convention. Like, for example, say the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. Now, that codifies some of the rules that guide diplomatic relations between states and that we will be learning now. Uh, after this, uh, after this chapter, the next chapter is of course the other Vienna Convention. Now, yet another example is WIPO, that is a World Intellect Intellectual Property Organization, uh, that is headquartered in Geneva, which is one of the specialized agencies of UNO. Now, this organization has consented to the convening of diplomatic conferences for two proposed international agreements, that is one pertaining to the protection of designs to ease cross-border trade, and the other is with regards to intellectual property, that is the IP agreement related to generic resources such as plants, animals, and microorganisms, and allied traditional knowledge associated with genetic resources. So this is an example for you how diplomatic conference is convened by passing a resolution of the General Assembly, which is normally by a recommendation of any of its subsidiary bodies, where the subsidiary body, for example, I've given you WIPO, there's a World Intellectual Property IP, World IP Organization, Intellectual Property Organization, where supposed recommends saying that we need to have a conference, and then it lays down the purpose of the conference so that, you know, you know the UNO agrees to you know, uh, organizing such a conference. And so thereby they pass a resolution to that effect. So where, for example, I've given you WIPO where, the, where WIPO says, yes, we need to have a conference. They'll give the object of it, the term, the condition, how the member states need to comply with certain uh, protocols to participate in the conference or a convention. And then UNO approves it and then passes a resolution in the General Assembly. And that's when, for example, WIPO can hold an organization, sorry, and uh, it can hold a diplomatic conference. So at present, just recently in July 2022, this thing has happened. This is the latest information for you. Somewhere in July 2022, or rather I'll say early 2022, WIPO, that is a World Intellectual Property Organization, which is headquartered in Genoa. It is a specialized agency of UNO. It consented to the convening of diplomatic conferences for two proposed international agreements. I'm reiterating, one is pertaining to the protection of designs to ease cross-border trade, and the other is with regards to intellectual property agreement related to genetic resources such as plants, animals, microorganisms, and the allied traditional knowledge associated with genetic resources. WIPO strategically continues to develop a legitimate framework in the arena of intellectual property, further securing IP rights. So diplomatic conferences procedures may even adapt to online dynamism. So they are talking about, you know, online holding online conferences, even, you know, conferences of such a scale that is at the scale of UNO or, you know, uh, it's such a huge scale. They're talking about having it even online. So they are, you know, yet to devise certain protocols. And in fact, they can even adapt to online dynamism while still retaining the spirit of traditional diplomatic conference protocols and procedures. Now, I told you what is the meaning of protocol. However, in legal sense, a protocol is defined as an international agreement that supplements or amends a treaty. That's a different type of protocol that is like, for example, you have the ICCPR, okay, International Covenant of Civil. What is it? ICCPR, civil. Does anyone know what is ICCPR? Can anyone tell me what is ICCPR? International Covenant on Civil. Wow. I mean, this is a very important document that you should be knowing ICCPR and ICSCER. Um, well, so, well, ICCPR is International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And of course, even this particular 
uh, convention has a protocol. Well, I'll not go into the detail of it because our subject is just related to diplomatic relations. Well, so in the legal sense, when we're talking about protocol, there are uh, protocols that are attached to an international agreement. It's like an instrument that is attached to international agreement that supplements or amends or you know, a particular treaty. So in the diplomatic sense, however, the term refers to the set of rules, procedures, convention, ceremonies that relate to relations between states. Just for a moment, uh, I'd like to remind you, in case we get disconnected, please join back. Now, in the general sense, again, it refers to rules of civility or etiquette. Now, Dr. P.M. Thorny opined that protocols are based, are rules based on principles of civility. Now, in the international diplomacy context, protocols refer to a set of planned actions to be implemented to achieve a designed agenda or a mission, or it's, it simply implies etiquettes of diplomacy and generally accepted, and that are generally accepted and established standards that need to be followed. It refers to a set of standard rules that may be followed during a conference or a diplomatic meeting. It ensures that the integrated rules are aligned with international culture and are meticulously or carefully followed. Protocols are to be implemented by a protocol officer for a particular mission or a diplomatic conference or a meeting. Now, this protocol officer facilitates the entire process, including the compliance procedure in alignment with the rules and procedures of that particular function, meeting, conference, or ceremony. Now, non-compliance to certain protocols may be considered as a grave fault on the part of the protocol officer, especially if it harms the honor and dignity of a particular diplomat. Like, for example, in case he forgets to, you know, follow a particular rule and that, you know, say there are different nations that are participating. So, you know, in case he, you know, he's oblivious of a particular, uh, you know, rule and he, you know, implements something else apart from the protocol. So it might, uh, you know, harm the dignity of a particular diplomat. So that would be considered as a grave Fault. For example, see seating arrangements, for example, in a conference, it's normally organized as per protocols. Now, seating for senior members is normally organized in the front rows. Seating for monarchs or kings, queens, etc., will be placed before the political heads of the state. Now, for example, if there is this king of England, so the king of England, his seat will be right in front, and after him will be, uh, of course, the prime minister of, uh, say, uh, London, you understand. I've, I'm not able to get her name well. So, so that would be the seating arrangement. The political heads of the state would be, uh, you know, the next row after the, you know, the head of the particular country. That is the, uh, in case it's, uh, you know, a kingdom. That is like whether it's a king or a monarch or there is some other rulers or it's a sultanate. Then it has a sultan of there or if they're just rulers. Then it could be just uh, depending upon what they call themselves. So seating of monarchs, kings, queens, rulers will be placed right in front or before the political heads of the state. Next, what about dinner parties or cocktail functions, which are part of these conferences? So arrangement of dinner parties, cocktail functions, and so on also attract legitimate protocols to be followed. For example, in some function, names of plenipotentiaries may be placed or these dignitaries uh, or diplomats may be placed at the table or even maps may be provided to find the right place where the dignitary is escorted to the dinner table. Now, again, availability of menus is a must. Appropriate crockery, appropriate cutlery is yet another factor that is considered at diplomatic parties. Now, the United Nations and protocol. The United Nations has got its protocols and licensing division, which is part of the United Nations organization called the Department for General Assembly and Conference Management, also called as DGACM. Now, this department has a protocol manual which enumerates the guidelines or lays down the guidelines within the ambit of which the department has to act while organizing diplomatic conferences and functions. So what is the fundamental function of DGACM? The fundamental function of DGACM is registration of all diplomatic personnel, uh, 
Suppose there is a diplomatic conference. So when the, the diplomats arrive, they do the registration process. So they register all the diplomatic uh, you know, personnel in case they are having certain staff members with them of permanent mission, or sometimes they may have family members with them who are, you know, who are accompanying them because they have uh, you know, accommodation provided to them. So registration of all diplomatic personnel or their support staff for permanent missions or observer offices, including their dependents, household employees, and you know, all these people, the registration is completed and they are provided passes, necessary passes, because United Nations grounds pass is, you know, it's mandatory for entering into the UN headquarters and passes for the members of permanent missions and observer officers include photographs of bearer and they differ in color for easy identification. Apart from that, this particular office, they also uh, carry on the registration process of governmental or intergovernmental delegation members. Likewise, like how uh, they do of diplomats, exactly the same. They even carry on the registration process of governmental or intergovernmental delegation members, representatives of specialized agencies, and associate members of regional commissions who are joining the sessions of General Assembly or probably any other meeting that is convened at the premises and they provide them passes as well. Apart from that, they maintain an updated comprehensive list. This is important. What is the role of the particular department, the protocols department, which is a part of DGACM, that is the Department for General Assembly and Conference Management. They maintain an updated comprehensive list of heads of state, heads of government, and ministers for foreign affairs of the member states of the UN, senior officials, and the union, and the UN, sorry, and the UN, that is the United Nations, and their dependents. Apart from that, they maintain and update the blue book. What is this blue book? Um, Blue, Blue Book is basically a book which contains an up-to-date information or up-to-date comprehensive list of diplomatic personnel of permanent of all permanent missions and observe, uh, observer officers. And apart from that, the department also advises permanent mission and observer officers, specialized agencies, and other departmental offices of the United Nations Secretariat on matters of protocol usage, general practice, and norms of diplomatic etiquette accepted at the UN. So towards this end, they may even lecture or, uh, you know, on matters of protocol and diplomatic etiquette and so on. So I believe you understand what is protocols. It's quite simple. And I also gave you the example, for example, even if they're having dinner parties or any seating arrangements, for example, this is one of the protocols that needs to be followed. Who does it is the protocol officer who is in charge of it. Like, for example, I said, let us take a simple example of, say, uh, England. Like, for example, you have the king there, King Charles. So he'll be given, obviously, a, a seat right in front. And then again, you know, the next row would be with the prime minister. Well, now I got her name. She is Truss, um, Elizabeth Truss, because she just became the uh, prime minister recently, the last month in September 2022. And uh, of course, she would be there. And of course, there are other, you know, cabinet members. So they would have, again, probably they will be sitting just beside her or probably in the next row, depending upon how the sitting arrangements is given. So the primary thing that has to be understood here is predominantly that depending upon the office, the seating arrangement is organized. And that's the protocol that the highest office deserves a seat, which is right in front. And apart from that, there are other dignitaries and depending upon who they are and what are what is the role that they are playing so accordingly seating arrangement is given and likewise even in uh, you know the parties or, or the dinner that follows these uh, these conferences so again sometimes the names of these plenipotentiaries these dignitaries are mentioned on the table or sometimes they're even given maps and they're even escorted to the table so this is again an example of protocol that's that needs to be followed you know for example in dinner parties that follow conferences. So protocols are nothing but certain rules of etiquette, certain guidelines that needs to be followed by organizing uh, you know, diplomatic conferences and so on. This is just an example for you. With this, we finish diplomatic conference protocol and procedures. Next chapter, 
we are going to learn about a very interesting chapter again. It is about the Vienna Conference on Diplomatic, sorry, Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Conferences and Protocols.